75 years ago, it was a real circus here at the docks in Summers, Montana. In 1915, there were three steamboats that made regular passenger runs down Flathead Lake, and competition was heated. Heated by about five cords of wood in the case of the big stern wheelers that made the round trip to Polson on the south end of the lake, some 35 miles away. Steamboat business was booming during World War I and competition was intense. It was not uncommon for captains to use barkers on the dock to sell passengers on the virtues of their boat. Your fastest, safest, and most luxurious way to Polson. The Montana Castle promptly at quarter after eight, so get aboard and enjoy a nice breakfast in our plush dining room. This way, folks, this way. This way, folks, this way. The Montana has all the equipment for your safety and comfort afloat. Separate water closets for the ladies and gents. State rooms. Draw poker and faro in the smoking room. Get aboard, folks. Captain Swanson will have you in Polson by 12.30 with stops at Dayton and Big Arm. And we give special attention to the ladies ladies and the little tykes. In addition to the passenger steamers, in 1915 there were also five steam tugs in use by the lumber companies and four steamboats that were used for hauling freight, towing barges and for carrying passengers on excursions and unscheduled runs. There was smoke on the water. Although the 12 steamboats on the lake in 1915 represented the peak of steamboat activity, there were many others, 33 in all, over a 40-year period. Steamboat transportation flourished long before 1915. It started in 1885 before Montana was a state. For the early settlers coming into the Flathead Valley, getting around Flathead Lake was a tough haul. Crude wagon trails made land travel around the lake a full day of hardship for passengers on the Allard stagecoach. There were two periods when traffic over the lake flourished, each sparked by a different set of circumstances. The first period started when settlers began coming on the Northern Pacific Railroad to Ravalli Junction. Those wishing to settle or work in what is now Flathead County took the stage to the foot of the lake, then caught a steamboat north to DeMarsville on the Flathead River. This is the site of DeMarsville, which was the head of navigation and for all practical purposes for the steamboats. Uh, not much here now to indicate that this was once a thriving little city with 15 saloons. Now there's uh, no sign or uh, any indication, just a fishing access and mosquitoes. When the Great Northern Railroad came into the northern end of the valley, the need for steamboats dropped drastically and the steamboat era seemed to be over. But 15 years later, the opening of the Flathead Indian Reservation for homesteading started another period of heavy north-south traffic on the lake. This continued until the completion of the Northern Pacific Line into Polson in 1917 and passable automobile roads around the lake greatly diminished steamboat revenues from both freight and passengers. Some of the 33 steamboats that plied Flathead Lake had short and tragic histories. Others, like the New Klondike and the Montana, were in use for many years. The first boat of any consequence to carry passengers on Flathead Lake was a sailboat, 40-footer called a Swan. It was built in 1883 and started plying these waters in 1884. The Swan was capable of hauling 20 tons, but a power source more dependable than the wind was needed to make the venture profitable. The Swan was frequently becalmed in the middle of Flathead Lake, and the winding course up the Flathead River made progress upstream almost impossible. In 1885, the owners converted the Swan to steam power with a small upright boiler and a donkey engine that drove a screw-type propeller. 
the converted swan was renamed the U.S. Grant, and that was the beginning of steamboating on Flathead Lake. With the increased power and speed, the U.S. Grant, skippered by J.C. Kerr, could make two round trips each week, from Lambert's Landing on the south, now Polson, to points on the Lake and River where landings had been established, Holt, Salish, and Egan. Obviously, the sign, no mosquitoes on the lake, points out a benefit to lake travel. But after the first season, the Grant needed better machinery. Captain Kerr obtained a new engine from Butte, which made the boat faster and more dependable. During the succeeding years, the boat was able to make the round trip every two days and made money for her owners. She was replaced in 1889 by the Tom Carter, shown here with the U.S. Grant at Gravel Bay at the foot of the lake. In 1885, neither the stage nor the horse-drawn freight wagons could compete with the steamboat that left the foot of the lake at 7 in the morning and reached the Flathead River settlements by early afternoon with 150 tons of freight and 150 passengers on board. The demand for boat service was so brisk by 1886 that another company brought in a boat from the east on two large railroad flat cars and went into competition with Captain Kerr. The boat was the Pocahontas and had the advantage over the little U.S. Grant being 70 feet long with a 20-foot beam and capable of carrying a bigger payload. Her owners advertised vigorously for passengers and freight and succeeded in cutting a share of the growing market. But the Pocahontas was fated for a short career. Disaster came in the fall of 1887 when she ran aground in a storm. According to the story that appeared in the Helena Herald, quote, After passing the Narrows, the steamer ran into a storm and was compelled to make for shore where the pilot expected to run into the channel between Melita Island and the lakeshore. She missed the channel and ran into shallow water and aground. She evidently tipped over and submerged. One woman, passenger, and child were landed safely in a boat while the men swam ashore. Most of the freight floated ashore and was salvaged, as was some mail." Unquote. Later on, the owners raised and remodeled the boat. She was renamed Dora and operated on the lake in various capacities, ending her career as a barge during World War I. Competition from the Pocahontas spurred the owners of the U.S. Grant to build a larger craft. They used native timber to build the boat on the Flathead River, and in the spring of 1889, they launched the Tom Carter, a stout steamer, wide and safe. She was propeller-driven, 80 feet long with a 16-foot beam, and bore the name of the last territorial delegate to Washington. Her two high-pressure steam engines pushed her along at 12 miles an hour in calm conditions. According to contemporary accounts, she was elegant and commodious and supplied with all the delicacies and luxuries of the season. Records show that on one of her best days, she made two round trips carrying 586 passengers and 40 tons of freight. After three or four busy seasons, the Tom Carter's useful days were over. She was beached and stripped of her machinery, which was put into the tugboat Cotter in 1901. In 1889, word of the Great Northern Railroad coming into the valley led some to believe that the Flathead River could be navigated as far north as the town site of Columbia Falls. Inspired by this idea, they built the Crescent. She was a flat-bottom, riverboat-type steamer of shallow draft, but bigger than the Tom Carter. Although she drew only 16 inches of water, the Crescent was the first of the bigger boats with spacious freight decks, private cabins, and a galley adjoining the dining salon. Horses were welcome. She was fitted with a stable that would accommodate 10 animals. She cost $16,000 to build and was 32 feet wide by 120 feet long. Her capacity was 75 tons of freight and 100 passengers. The idea of running the river to Columbia Falls was abandoned after the Crescent ran aground on a sandbar a few miles above DeMarsville in July 1891. The venture failed, but use of the boat on Flathead Lake was so much competition for the owners of the Tom Carter and the U.S. Grant that they were forced to build the bigger and better state of Montana. In 1890, David McGinnis wrote of his experience on the Crescent. Our boat was crowded and freight was spread over everywhere and she was a small boat but sturdy withal. Nevertheless, we were somewhat uneasy to be embarked upon such a small craft where long stringers of burning wood were constantly being discharged upon the decks and cargo until it appeared to us that the boat would catch on fire and burn. And then I thought, where will we be? Far from shore and in water too deep for wading. 
But while I was anxiously watching those long, fiery sparks, the other passengers were entirely unconcerned, playing scat and sledge all the way. The Crescent's 19-foot paddle wheel on the stern could push her from DeMarsville to the foot of the lake in three hours in favorable lake conditions. The Crescent was operated profitably for four or five years. When she was taken out of service, her machinery and fittings were used for one of the steamboats running the Kootenai River into British Columbia. It was a heady time for the water transportation companies. The Great Northern was bringing labor and materials from the south across the lake, and business was good. Not to be outdone by the Crescent, Captain Kerr of the U.S. Grant and the owners of the Tom Carter decided to build a bigger steamboat. They bought a hull and other components in Portland and shipped them to Ravalli on the Northern Pacific. From there, the sections were hauled overland, no mean task through the soggy bottomlands of the reservation to the foot of the lake where it was assembled. The state of Montana, costing $25,000, was to be the largest steamboat ever to sail Flathead Lake, 150 feet long with a 26-foot beam and an 18-inch draft. She was a sternwheeler with great wide paddles operated by heavy long pistons from the steam boxes of the engines. An advertisement for the state of Montana read, Just like home, where you can eat, drink, sleep, and view the most beautiful scenery in the world. Well, that hasn't changed. She was skippered by Captain Kerr and manned by a crew of 25. She was fitted out with all the conveniences for comfortable travel, including a saloon and a dining room with fine linens. 18 staterooms attested to the demand for first-class accommodations for the Lake Passage. The state of Montana was destined for an early disaster and only saw service for one year. A storm broke her moorings at DeMarsville and she drifted aground at Foy's Bend and broke up. Today, it's hard to imagine the Flathead River being that destructive, but in those days, before Hungry Horse Dam moderated the flow, the river could turn into a rampaging demon in a heavy runoff, with logs and uprooted trees coming downstream like battering rams. The machinery from the state of Montana was rescued and sent to another boat being built in British Columbia. The shell of the state of Montana lay for a long time on the shore and was finally battered to pieces by the elements. She was put into service on the 4th of July, 1891, and on her maiden voyage carried about 300 people on an Independence Day excursion to Wild Horse Island. Here we see her band on the deck. And this would be her galley crew getting into the picture. The owners were obviously very proud of their brand new steamer, little knowing that in less than a year she'd be a broken and battered hulk. The state of Montana was the largest of the lake steamers ever built, and not to be confused with the Montana, the smaller steamship that was in service during World War I, or with the Montana I and Montana II, two tugboats of the 1930s. She was the state of Montana, and in a class by herself. This steamer, the Lillian, was built in 1891 as an excursion boat for the Cliff House in DeMarsville. She was 85 feet long and was one of the few boats to make it upriver to Columbia Falls. The Lillian was only in service for a couple years. Another smaller steamboat built in 1891 was the Marianne. She was built as a freight boat and tug for the Washington Feed Company. She was a sternwheeler, 50 or 60 feet long, and apparently stayed in service for about 20 years. She was listed in the 1916 Registry of Boats. From 1894 until 1909, a slack period for commerce on the lake, the Mary Ann, along with the Dora and the Queen, were used for passengers and excursions. Not much is known about the Queen. She was reportedly built in 1907, although some accounts indicate she was around earlier. She was used for passengers, freight, and as a logging tug. The Queen had a capacity of 42 passengers or 10 tons of freight. She served for about eight years and her fate is unknown. 
The boat beside her may be the Dora. Gene Hodge, who had a long career as a steamboat skipper on Flathead Lake, must have had a crystal ball when he built the first Klondike about 1904. He was five years ahead of the booming business to come with the arrival of the homesteaders. But he gambled on the future with a 120-foot sternwheeler. A newspaper clipping dated April 1907 states, Navigation on Flathead Lake is now open and the steamer Klondike is now making its regular trips from Polson to the head of the lake three times a week. The article also says that many people traveling to points on the northern Pacific take this trip during the spring and summer as it is regarded as one of the most delightful trips in the country. It was during this pre-World War I period that visitors from eastern states were routed into the Flathead Valley on the Great Northern but made the return trip on the Northern Pacific by way of a Flathead Lake steamer and the stage line to Revalley. As these first pictures show, the Klondike was built with an open boat deck, but when business picked up, it was roofed over to accommodate more passengers. Here the Klondike is taking on fuel. It took about five cords of wood to make the round trip from Summers to Polson. As lake business began to pick up again, two competitive boats were built in 1907, the Wasco and the Swan. The Swan was a 26-passenger steam launch that went down in the mouth of the Flathead River a year later, then raised and renamed the Undine. The Wasco was built at Rollins by Captain Barnett, and a news item from May 1907 states, The steamboat built at Rollins during the winter is ready for and waiting for the machinery that is now in the hands of the Great Northern Railroad. The new boat is 80 feet long by 17 foot beam. An item in the paper the following month says, the new steamer Wasco made her first trip from Summers to the foot of the lake the first of the week and will hereafter make regular daily trips and connect with the auto lines from Kalispell. The new boat is a beauty, very fast and has fine seagoing qualities. The next year, 1908, the Wasco caught fire and burned in Rollins Bay. In 1909, Captain Swanson rebuilt her and named the new version the Montana. The Montana became a familiar sight on the lake for the next decade. She gave the new Klondike and the gasoline-powered passenger launches stiff competition. She underwent several structural and cosmetic changes during her career and is frequently confused with the state of Montana in the articles and pictures that have appeared in newspapers. The Montana was well appointed with state rooms, dining rooms, smoking rooms, and separate restrooms. But Phoenix might have been a better name for the Montana. She caught fire again in 1923 and rose from the ashes a second time with the help of insurance money. She sank at her dock in Polson about 1925, was dismantled and the machinery salvaged. But 
But back to 1908, the news was out. The Flathead Indian Reservation was going to be open to white settlers. The homesteaders would provide a new market for water transportation companies. The Great Western Land Company brought an excursion party of home seekers into the Flathead and chartered the Montana for a trip down the lake. And the homesteaders did come with horses, equipment, furniture, supplies, and families. They came into Kalispell to file their claims, and once again, the lake became the primary channel of commerce north and south in the valley. With business on the lake booming, Captain Hodge decided the Klondike needed to be improved to compete with the Montana and the smaller but speedier gasoline-powered passenger boats. In May 1910, he launched the new Klondike, a sternwheeler, 120 feet long with a 26-foot beam. The new Klondike drew 30 inches of water and had a carrying capacity of 425 passengers and 118 tons of freight. She featured four staterooms and a dining room. The new Klondike was the queen of the lake for the next decade and was a familiar vessel to many of the old timers still living in the Flathead Valley. The new Klondike could carry 12 automobiles, and the trip one way from Polson to Summers cost $3 for car and driver. An engineer on the new Klondike in 1920 recalled that a convention of bankers and their ladies chartered the steamer for a night trip. Two barges were towed and a thousand people danced and partied out on the lake where prohibition wasn't so easy to enforce. The new Klondike sank at her dock in Polson in 1926, but parts of her lived on in various steamboats that followed in the 30s and 40s. Here we see the Klondike six-foot steering wheel, which is now on display at the Miracle of America Museum in Polson. The city of Dixon was built in 1912 for the express purpose of transporting passengers and freight on the lower Flathead River between Dixon and the Buffalo Rapids Bridge. The city of Dixon was 80 feet long with a 20 foot beam and drew only 15 inches of water. The first attempt to navigate the river had to be aborted due to treacherous river conditions. The boat was docked until the next spring and succeeded in making the round trip in higher water. The city of Dixon was never a financial success, and she burned after being struck by lightning in 1914. Another steamboat competing for business on the lake during the First World War period was the DeMarsville. Built in 1914 at Summers, she was used for passenger and freight service and also as a logging tug. The DeMarsville burned in 1918. There were a couple of steamers during this period that were primarily freighters. The Big Fork, built by Captain Anderson in 1911, was 60 feet long and had two steam engines and twin screws. She was sheathed with iron plates and is shown here breaking her way through the ice, lengthening the season for carrying payloads. She was mainly used to tow grain and livestock barges. The Big Fork was renamed the Summers of Polson in 1918. She sank in the Narrows in 1919. 
The biggest freighter to ply the lake was the Helena, built by James Kehoe at Big Fork in 1915. She was 110 feet long with a 25-foot beam, powered by a marine steam engine that was a show model at the Chicago World's Fair. The Helena had forward holes and an overhead derrick for loading freight off the docks or beaches. The Helena was built at a cost of $10,000 and her annual net income was about $3,600. In 1915, over 400,000 bushels of grain were shipped across the lake from Polson to the Great Northern Terminal at Summers. Other cargoes included flour, baled hay, cordwood, feed, potatoes, apples, and equipment. The Polson merchants could ship merchandise from the Great Northern Terminal at Summers for 10 cents per hundredweight by steamboat. It would cost them 50 cents per hundredweight to bring it overland from the Northern Pacific at Ravalli. In 1915, the lake steamers together had a potential daily capacity of 900 tons. Jack Kehoe was eight years old when his father built the Helena, but he was old enough for deckhand duties, and in 1921, at 14, he became the Helena's pilot. This is the spot on the Flathead River that was known as Holt in the old days and the steamboats used to come down river from Demarsville, stop here and take on wood for the trip down the lake to Lambert's Landing which is now known as Polson. Here at Holt, Jack runs the Kehoe Agate Shop and has the wheelhouse and other parts of the Helena to remind him of his steamboat and days. This is the cups and off the Helena, steamboat Helena my dad built in 1915. He was a marine engineer on the Great Lakes most of his life and he wanted to get a change away from the place he was in, go out and build something for himself. So he came out here and built the steamboat Helena in 1915. All this equipment came off the boats off the Great Lakes. This capstan was off one. This is used to, it has a ratchet down there that will pull about four times its normal weight straight on the caps in there. These are big bars that are put in there, as many as you wanted, and it could lift probably five tons weight. We used to pull the boat off the bottom and do various things like that with it. This is the anchor that one of the anchors came off the boat this was a small one we had a much heavier one that we used it real bad to put out and pull a boat off a bar or something like that and this is a the big propeller we had we started out with that one over there is a lot smaller but this one wasn't heavy enough so we put this on and ran for many years it weighs about seven or eight hundred pounds <coughs> Well, this is the wheelhouse off the Helena, and this is the steering wheel that my dad bought from, bought from Chicago. This was off a boat in the Great Lakes. I can't remember her name now, but he bought all these old things second hand because they were in good shape and real fine pieces. And there's a lot of different pieces in here, like the running lights. And this is a corking mallet. Iron, this is the sort of a thing you cork a wooden ship with. This is a, <coughs> this is lignum vita, very hard wood. This one, the noise you hear on here sometimes, when they're corking wooden, wooden ships, you can hear them for a mile because they ring. This is oakum that you put in the seams of a wooden ship to make her tight so she doesn't leak. If you could smell it, you'd never forget the smell. It's flax with a special oil in it, and it has a special t purpose in keeping a ship tight so she won't leak. <coughs> this, uh, it might be a mystery to a lot of people how you would put water in a boiler that had an even pressure of, say, 150 pounds. How would you put water in against that pressure and put water in the boiler? And this was a very special tool that was invented. It was called a Pemberthy. And 
it had a bouncing principle that that kicked the water up against the pressure of the steam and would put water in the boiler against that pressure. But it wasn't simple. Needs a little shining up, but we had two different, three different ones of these that my dad used to experiment with. The marine engineer always took great pride in his machinery and whistles were one of them because every boat had a different type of whistle, so you can tell them in the fog or the dark or no matter where you heard them. This is a bilge pump that you pump the water out of a wooden ship with <coughs> when she laid her on the light. It always leak a little bit, so you'd have to pump them off by hand because those days we had no big gasoline outfits to do it with. This was all done by hand, so we could do it anywhere out in the lake. There's no wires to connect up those days for electricity out in the middle of the lake. This is a sea clamp. We had two of them. This was to pull up the planks up the bluff of the bow and around the stern where they had to be bent. And the planks were bent, were steamed first, real hot, and then these big clamps were pulled up with blocks and pulled them up so that she could be spiked up around the bow of the boat and the stern. It took a lot of pressure to pull it up there. And this piece here is a part of a stanchion that came out of the old steamboat to Marsville, built about 1900. This is a broad axe that was used to hew the keel and the kilson of the boat with, or some of the ribs had to be cut this way because we didn't have the uh, power to, to run a saw to cut stuff that way, so they had to be hewed to shape. These are two compasses we used on the lake. You wouldn't think a lake 20 miles wide and 35 miles long, you'd have to have a compass in, but at times during the winter months and it was very foggy or in the spring, sometimes you couldn't see 100 feet ahead of the boat, so you had to have a compass. This is called a card compass. It has no alcohol in it, but it's still true north, and this one has an alcohol. This part floated in alcohol, and the alcohol was stolen during the prohibition. Somebody stole the alcohol out of there and drank it. <laughs> well, this is the lifeboat off the helm that we used to use for, in case we ever did need it out in the middle of the lake, which we didn't, but it could run a line. If we had a, got up on a bar, we could run a line over with it and use it for many things. Just a work boat around it. The Helena ran into one of the most severe storms ever recorded on Flathead Lake. In December 1924, while carrying 20 carloads of apples, the temperature went to 30 below and gale force winds whipped the lake. The Helena was forced to seek shelter, but visibility was only about 100 feet. With the guidance of his father, who had all the timings of all the bays, Jack piloted the Helena into the relative calm of Safety Bay. They kept the boilers stoked to keep the holds warm, and not one apple was frozen. The Helena was dismantled in 1932 and the remains of the hull are still on the river bottom near Holt. Here at the Miracle of America Museum in Polson, curator Gil Mangles has gathered mementos of the steamboat era, including the logging tug Paul Bunyan. This is the wheelhouse of the Paul Bunyan. The Paul Bunyan was one of many tugs that served the lumber industry on Flathead Lake. And although the Paul Bunyan was not steam, it was diesel, it represents a class of workboat that was part of lake history. The first tugboat on Flathead Lake was the Jim Hill, shipped in by the Summers Lumber Company in 1901. Other early tugs in use were the A. Guthrie, the Marriott, and the Kootenai, which was originally named the Cotter. The Wesley Wells, shown here, was a twin screw boom tug. The logs were run down the rivers to Flathead Lake, where they were boomed together by the tugs and towed to the mills. In 1904 and 1905, the Howard James, the Willis, the Defiance, and the Reliance were built.
Gil Mangles of the Miracle of America Museum has restored much of the Paul Bunyan, the diesel that made steam tugs obsolete. We're standing under the Fantail, the Paul Bunyan logging tow boat. You see the pretty impressive looking screw here in the rudder. This was used on Flathead Lake for pulling log booms to the sawmills, built in 1926 to replace the uh, steam tows. This was more powerful than the uh, steamboats were uh, with a 180 horsepower crude oil diesel engine and therefore it, it got the legendary name of, of Paul Bunyan the logger because of its immense strength. Among uh, the other things we have on display in the Miracle of America Museum is, is the wheel of the Klondike's uh, boats uh, used, uh, there was Klondike 1 and Klondike 2. Many of the steamboats uh, burned on the lake. Uh, I suppose the, uh, the, all the steam power, the wood and, and ashes and so forth. Uh, here we see a spider or a hub for uh, the paddle wheel off of the Klondike. And you see these holes in these slots here. The spokes would bowl in there. This would hold them uh, in a proper position for the paddles to uh, be bolted onto. Here we see a brass light, which supposedly came from the Montana. And before uh, we had some, uh, a lot of lighting, these torch baskets were used around on the piers and on, on the rocks and they would put a pitch knot in here or brush and light them on fire to, uh, to light the way for the boats. There was still some steam in use for work boats like the SS Hodge 1 and 2, the Montana 1 and 2, and the Klondike 3. One of the last steam-powered sternwheelers on the lake was the Silver City, built by Gene Hodge at Polson in 1936. The Silver City was an excursion craft 100 feet long and 30 feet wide with a beer parlor on board. Today it's fun to imagine the excitement folks must have felt meeting relatives and friends arriving by steamboat. The steam whistles signaling arrival, the churning paddle wheels, the smell of wood smoke, clanking, rattling of rocker arms and pistons and the hiss of escaping steam. Leviathans of Flathead Lake. Yes, there was smoke on the water. 